Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So why am I holding a Bowie knife? Um, well, I'll tell you straight up, I'm not actually really going to talk about Bowie knives, but it sort of illustrates a point that I am going to talk about, and that is that there's a lot of debate about how these should be used. Why is that? Well, very simply because people who study heme I love to have a manual or treatise that they can go to and study to find out how a given weapon was used. So whether it's small sword or arming sword or uh, falchion even, or some kind of sabre. Um, and we have treatises for all of these things, but a weapon that we know that was hugely popular in the 19th century, which was a period when they were making manuals on pretty much everything you can think of, um, the Bowie knife doesn't really have any good manuals for its use. Now that's not to say that there's no source material at all, there is some source material. I won't go into that because this isn't a, really a video talking about Bowie knives. It's actually a video talking about HEMA weapons where there aren't sources for them. And there is a growing trend because there are certain weapons, like the Bowie knife, which have a lot of fans, essentially, for want of a better word. Um, the weapons that have always been, whether they're kind of, you know, they've got romantic idea attached to them, nationalistic idea in some cases, um, or just they're funky and weird. So if we take something like the flail, for example, um, and yes, I will go back to doing some a couple more videos about flails in the future. In fact, I filmed one ages ago, but I wasn't very happy with how it turned out. So, um, But things like flails, uh, the Polish sabre, for example, um, the Russian shashka, um, even if we're looking at sort of Oriental Asian weapons as well, then maybe things like the Indian Qatar. Um, and there are no real written manuals or treatises for the use of these weapons, or so we think, so we thought, with some exceptions. Now, if we take the, if we just go back to the Bowie knife as just an illustrative example again, there are some sources for how these were used, um, but those sources don't necessarily agree in some cases because of course in any given time there isn't only one way to use a weapon so if we were to say you know based on no treatises and no manuals if we if we imagine that there were no treatises for the use of the small sword and we all debated about how small swords were used some people would argue vociferously that oh you should only do this with it and you shouldn't do that with it and you must never do this but maybe you could do a bit of this and a bit of that and you would notice that because they don't have a historical text to work from and to back up their arguments, it's entirely subjective. And this is one of the problems that we come across with reconstructing martial arts, is that people argue about points based on a lack of evidence rather than evidence. And I hope something that I've tried to champion in this uh, video channel of mine, this YouTube channel, is trying to use evidence as much as possible. And when there isn't evidence, just going, hey, you know, we don't know. Uh, you could use common sense, you could use logic, but that's not always correct. Remember that someone who just, for example, imagine there's no small sword treatises, which I should point out there are many small sword treatises, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Someone who had no access to any treatises or manuals for the small sword may, for example, conclude that you use it exactly like a modern uh, epée let's say, it was like epée fencing. And they'd be wrong, pretty much. Um, epée fencing looks pretty much, not very much like um, small sword fencing at all. And, you know, there are things like grabs and disarms and grapples in small sword. Um, use of the offhand was sometimes used in small sword, although not always. Um, the, way that the, uh, the way that the footwork uh, works and the lunge and recover is basically similar to the fundamentals of, of um, modern fencing, modern sport fencing, because modern sport fencing came out of foil fencing, which came out of practice for small sword. But there are differences because of the different context, and there's my favourite word, um, because of course in a sporting context, it, it will naturally evolve towards scoring points under a given rule set. So the rule set will sculpt the, the art, sculpt the, the sport or the martial art. Whereas in fighting, the only thing that sculpts or dictates the martial art is what, what works, what can work, and what's not too dangerous to work. But the, the real point that I want to make is, if we now actually go to the small sword treatises, we'll see that actually there's a fair variety in the way that the small sword was employed. It wasn't that everybody in Europe, and beyond Europe in fact, used the small sword in only one way. It was used in a variety of ways. And that's sort of what we see with the sources that refer to the 
Bowie knife as well. Um, it, it seems that it wasn't only used in one way, it was probably used in a variety of ways. So people who argue about what you should and shouldn't do with a Bowie knife should have a bit of a reality check and just remember, hold on, if we look at, if we look at other systems, longsword or rapier or sabre, where there's lots of manuals for their use or treatises for their use, we see that actually there's a variety of systems. So that's pretty much the same for most weapons. It might, I'm not going to say it's always the case, um, I'm, uh, but generally speaking, any weapon will have a variety of different ways of using it. There will be different schools, different, different schools of thought of how that weapon is best employed. Now the final point I want to make is um, about weapons where there aren't really any text describing their use. So Polish Sabre has um, got really popular, I would say particularly in America, I don't know why, maybe because there's lots of people of Polish descent um, in America, I don't know, maybe I don't know. I don't know the reasons for it, but Polish Sabre, um, you know, there are books now published about it. Richard Marsden has a, a book, I haven't seen it myself, but I've heard it's a good book on Polish Sabre. And it is a reconstruction. There are no manuals, there are no treatises on 17th century style Polish Hussar Sabre. Um, and so, it, but it's based on educated um, research and common sense based on related sources. So for example there's a German source, uh, Hussler I think it's pronounced, he, um, he talks a bit about the so-called, I believe he talks about the so-called cross-cutting art. In the 17th century the Polish were famous for using their sabres and they, their system of sabre fencing was known, it was known as a thing. Um, that's not to say, again, it's not to say that all Polish sabre um, systems were the same. It's very likely that there were variants, just the same as in English backsword of the 18th century. There is, there's slightly different systems within, within England for using the backsword. They're not all the same, although they share common, some common features. Probably exactly the same thing in 17th century Poland for using the shabla, the sabre. Um, there were probably a variety of different schools, uh, just different teachers with different ideas and different philosophies. And, but they probably shared some common features. And yes, you can absolutely come up with some, uh, and Daria uh, is Deb's ghost, another example of someone who's uh, come up with, uh, done research into references talking about Polish sabre, um, including treatises and non-treatises. So there's descriptive historical accounts talking about how the shabla was used, but equally there are treatises that make reference to how Easterners, as, as the uh, Germans regarded them, used their, um, used their sabres. And that could refer, of course, to Polish and Hungarians and Turks as well. You know, Turks are shown in treatises um, as well. So, um, so there is a way that you can, even when a weapon doesn't have a, um, a treatise or a manual of use, there is a way that you can use historical data available, put it together, inject a bit of frog DNA as Steve Hick, who's one of the godfathers of, of modern HEMA. Steve Hick once used this term frog DNA that's a reference to Jurassic Park of course because in Jurassic Park they didn't have the full DNA sequence to make the dinosaur just like our, um, our Polish Shabla for example. So you have to inject some frog, frog DNA which could be some common sense or modern uh, ethnographic comparisons with maybe Filipino martial arts or whatever. Um, so, you can attempt to reconstruct the use of weapons where there isn't a treatise or a manual f directly for the use of that weapon, such as Bowie Knife, such as Polish Shabla. The final example I'm going to talk about is the um, Cossack, Russian Cossack Shashka. Now, uh, many of you will know what a Shashka is. It's essentially a sabre. There's nothing particularly unusual about it, except for it doesn't have a handguard. Um, and that is pretty damned unusual, especially when we're talking about 18th and 19th century, because sabres everywhere else pretty much had handguards on them. And um, I have seen some, okay, I'm going to be blunt here and perhaps a little bit rude, some fucking hilarious video on YouTube about how the Russian shashka could have been used. And for anybody who knows anything about the use of swords based on historical sources, based on historical treatises, this video is just awful. It's bloody awful. Um, and uh, this guy might be experienced in some martial arts, but um, I sure hope that <laughs> he never has to rely on the use of his shashka uh, method, because it just it's just rubbish. Anyway, um, to get to the point, um, the, the, 
for a long time people wanted to know how the shashka was used um, and again I should say that it's quite likely that shashka was used in a variety of different ways and also was probably used slightly differently at different periods so the weapon itself was in use from the 17th century perhaps even earlier through to the, the 20th century in fact it was still used in World War I and World War II um, and uh, so it's very likely that across that period of time it wasn't used the same way right the way across that period just the same as you know, bayonets weren't used the same way across that period. They were used wildly differently from the 17th to the 20th century. Um, but um, additionally, at any one time, let's say in the time of Napoleon, when Napoleon was invading Russia, it's very likely that not all Cossacks used their uh, used their shashka in exactly the same way. It's very likely that they there were different. Um, sort of tribal groups who maybe had their own characteristic techniques and, and perhaps little um, particular details of how they used that weapon, even if there were common background elements to how it was used. But uh, recently it's been pointed out, and I must say, I, when I started looking at this treatise I did realise um, that I had seen it before, um, but recently it was pointed out there is a Russian treatise from 1899, and I will link it below here, which actually shows the shashka being used. So there we go, and this happens sometimes. This, this happens that sometimes there's a weapon that people don't think there's a source for, and they make up their method, and then a treatise comes along showing how this was actually used in period, and it's completely different. And you know what? I think the most surprising thing about how the shashka is used in 1899 um, is that essentially it's used like any other sabre. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really funny because people got fixated on the fact that wow there's this really cool Cossack sabre and it doesn't have a guard on it so it must have been used differently. It must have, you wouldn't use this guard and maybe you'd hold it like this and you'd cut like this and you know you wouldn't do this and you would do that. Uh, in actual fact and then a treatise comes along from 1899 showing the shashka and how it was used and it was used like a sabre. It was used like any other sabre. So sometimes people can get it really, really wrong, and this is the main point of the video, people can get it really, really wrong when they try and reconstruct the use of a historical weapon without historical sources. Um, and I'm not saying that shashkas were always used exactly like a sabre. There, there's some um, implication in this source that the, sabre, that the shashka is held slightly differently and maybe the guards are formed slightly differently to how it's done with a with a conventional sabre which has a handguard of some kind but by and large it seems that in 1899 in Russia when they were still using shashkas and they were still using them for the next 40-50 years pretty much um, it seems that they were using them pretty much like sabres were used all over the rest of Europe generally speaking with only minor differences, if at all. Um, so there we go, guys. Um, you can reconstruct the use of weapons when we don't have a treatise, but there are so many pitfalls and it's very, very difficult. And you have to be aware that you might get it massively wrong. Um, and it could be that the way that that weapon used was actually far more normal and uh, far more like something else we do know than maybe you thought it was. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.